Hey, what's up guys? Here is the video where I answer the questions from the previous video. If you didn't get a chance to ask me a question and you did want to ask a question, and this is especially for the non-Christians, I think I'll do a separate video one day for the Christians, but this is primarily for the non-Christians. If you didn't get a chance yet, or if you didn't share this with your friends, if you are the Christian, um, then I recommend go ahead and do that. And I'll, I'll still be looking at the comments for that last video or even down in the comments below for this video. And just to announce, I will be out for the next two weeks. Uh, I will be in Korea traveling with my wife and with my baby. Okay, and so without further ado, let's jump into the comment section. And we'll start here with who I believe is maybe Danny. Because I saw in my notifications it said the name, but then if you could see the name here, uh, it's a random string of letters and stuff. But Danny, I'll just call you Danny. Danny asked the question, how do you stop committing gluttony? And that's a really good question. I was just talking to someone the other day about how gluttony tends to be looked over. Uh, we don't talk about that one as much. And uh, I would say actually that one hits a little more home for me because, well, I'm someone who has a really major sweet tooth. And uh, at certain times I can't really control my eating. And so over the years, I, my weight has fluctuated a lot because uh, I can't always control myself. And so this is a really good one. And so thank you, Danny, for the question. Let's look at a few verses. And we're gonna start right here in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, which says, But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And that's a really awesome principle. Now, obviously, Paul is not talking about gluttony or eating food specifically, but he's saying just in general, I discipline my body. I exercise self-control so that after preaching and teaching people, I don't go away and become a drunkard, or I don't go away and fall into lustful temptations, or I don't go away and maybe gorge myself um, at a buffet. Let's look at another verse that uh, was written by Paul. It comes from Philippians 3.19. And it says, Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Now this verse actually looks like it's talking about gluttony because it says their God is their belly. Um, Paul is actually talking more about our spiritual desires, our emotional desires, our fleshly desires that we give into. And so, of course, under that umbrella of just really giving into your fleshly desires, of course, we'd also have giving into your desire to overeat and to eat excessively and to idolize food because that's really what gluttony is. You are making food into an idol. It's something that gives you supreme pleasure and satisfaction. Uh, it is something that you look forward to and uh, something maybe that you also use to comfort you, to help you when you're stressed out. Um, I'm guilty of that. I think a lot of people are, but this is what we're talking about. And I want to offer up one more verse that will help us to answer this question properly. And so in 1 Corinthians 6.19, Paul says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Okay, and this verse is just a wonderful verse to use in general. We're not exactly talking about just the physical body. Paul is pointing to the greater reality that as Christians, the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in us. And because that's true, uh, we are now the temple in that sense, right? And it's not, it's not exactly just talking about the physical body because the Holy Spirit is spirit, so he's dwelling in a spiritual place, right? Uh, but... But even having said that, there is still a physical component. So there's a physical component and then there's also the spiritual component. And so it's really important for us to know we are the temple of God. And the question then becomes, well, how should you treat the temple of God? And I would say we should certainly treat the temple of God well with respect and honor, not as though we are honoring ourselves, but we are making sure that this body is well taken care of even physically and, and health-wise. And so to loop around now and answer your question, I would say the Christian should treat their body as a temple. They should not be won over or given over to fleshly desires. And because those two things are true and something we ought to do, well, overeating and excessive eating and I'd call it uh, the idolization of food should not be a part of the Christian life. And so then if you're struggling with that, then you would surrender this over to the Lord uh, you'd seek some help because this is sin. It's something to be confessed and worked on. And uh, you would find that kind of help in community. And so I hope that's helpful. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, we had one of our 
Mosaic students ask a bunch of questions. So if you go back and look at the previous video, you're gonna see a bunch of questions from Michael. And so I told Michael that I would only answer the questions that I think a non-Christian would be interested in. And so with that, the first question from Michael I chose is, what is your favorite argument for the existence of God? Now, I really like that question because I think for everybody it is different, right? Everybody finds uh, certain arguments to be more compelling and everybody likes to also use certain arguments when they're trying to defend the faith. Now, my favorite one is actually really simple. I would actually probably call this the emotional appeal, right? Because I, I think there's a lot of different philosophical arguments that we can make. And so when I was a non-Christian, back when I was about 15 years old, the thing that got me believing in God was just a very simple question. And the question was, do you really believe that all of this would be for nothing? Now, of course, there will be people out there who will just flatly say, no, I don't believe that all of this is for a purpose. Uh, we just happen to be here and we can make the most of it, right? Uh, for me, though, and I, I would suspect for a lot of different people too, that was not compelling enough for me. And you can call that a cope. You can call it whatever you want. I actually think that there's a reason why uh, non-Christians can go through life, observe the world and, and the universe and not be satisfied with the answer that after this life there's nothing. Let me read for you Ecclesiastes 3.11 which says he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also he has put eternity into man's heart yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. And so what does this say here? This is Solomon writing who I believe was the wisest person to ever live. He made some really terrible mistakes toward the end of his life but he was still uh, he had this supernatural wisdom. And so in his supernatural wisdom, he's writing these words and he says that eternity has been put in the heart of man. Now, what that means is that everybody has a sense and, and maybe some people are a little more attuned to that sense than others. Uh, but I do believe everyone has a sense that there is something more. There is an, an eternity. I would even say that uh, many people do believe that there must be a God but the reality is because of something called sin, uh, sin has put a veil over our eyes. And because of sin, we really are not interested in the idea of a God in eternity. And so we do whatever we can to come up with different ideas and philosophies and theories to block out that reality. So I hope that's helpful uh, in terms of answering the question for me. It's just a really simple question of, do you really believe that this is all there is? And for me, as a non-Christian, I had to say, no, I think there must be some kind of a God. Okay, now moving on to one more of Michael's questions. And this one could get really complicated. So I, I just wanna do the simple version uh, just because I hope that there are non-Christians watching this video. I don't want to overwhelm you with information. And so this is gonna be the simpler version and I'm gonna reword the question. Uh, hopefully that's okay with you, Michael. And so the question is, does God save everybody? Okay, so I would warn you if you're a non-Christian, just know that this question is a really common question even among Christians. And I believe the reason for that is because this is a very emotional issue. It has a lot of emotional, really big implications depending on what you believe about this. My greater view on this is despite what I believe the scripture is saying, uh, I still leave a little bit of room to, to be able to say that maybe I'm wrong about this. Okay, so whatever position and answer I give right now, I'm willing to believe that I could be wrong about this. All right, so I wanna show you a couple of verses really quick from Ephesians. Uh, there's a lot more verses I could show you. I'm just gonna show you just a couple. Okay, and so Ephesians chapter one, verse four and five says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. And so we have some really clear language in there. Now, the meaning may not be as clear to us when we try to interpret this and really dissect it, but uh, let's just look at the clear language and let's talk about that really quick. And so we see in here, we see the word chose, that he chose us. Now, when you think of choice, typically that's gonna mean I'm choosing one thing over another, right? You don't typically get to choose everything. In most cases, for something to be actually a choice, there has to be something that is being chosen and then the thing that is not being chosen. Let me give you another scripture to think about. And this comes from John chapter 10, verse 11 and 15. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. 
As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, this verse could be interpreted in a multitude of ways, I believe, of course. But what is the strongest interpretation for this? When we really put it in the context of scripture and we really look at all the words of Jesus, I believe the strongest position would be that the sheep are a select group, right? There's other verses that talk about sheep and goats, right? That the sheep represent the people of God and the goats represent the people who have rejected the gospel message, the people who reject God. And so then the implication and the understanding would be if Jesus is saving and dying for the sheep, well, that is a select group. And then there is another group that is not being saved. And another point would be, uh, we know from the scripture and, and really, especially if you've become a Christian and you have the Holy Spirit, uh, we know that at one time we were enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ and there was no good in us, right? We couldn't just spontaneously become good of our own free will. God had to make a change in our heart in order for us to even choose him. And if it's true that somehow we can choose God apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, I would just ask, how does that happen? Because I, I'm of the firm belief that before we come to know Jesus, we are completely evil, right? Now, yes, we can do good things because we're made in the image of God. We're all capable of some level of love and care and concern and mercy and grace. And in terms of our actual being, we are evil. Okay, I don't wanna to get too deep into the weeds there. And so I hope that just gives an idea of how to think of this issue. But I hope that's helpful for any non-Christian that might be watching this. If this is uncomfortable for you for any reason, we'll just know that that's pretty normal to be uncomfortable with some of these truths because, well, these truths are higher than us, right? If they were something that we could just easily grasp and know and everything just makes sense, well, I wouldn't be so confident that that comes from God. Because these kinds of truths are uncomfortable, for me, this is a small confirmation of God's truth. Okay, so those were the three questions that I saw uh, as being most important to answer. Uh, maybe I'll get to some of Michael's other questions on another day. But if you are non-Christian and you wanna ask another question, please feel free to do so. As I said, I'm gonna be on break for two weeks. And so I'll be back um, basically with making another video in three weeks or so. We're also working on a couple student live streams and maybe we're gonna turn those live streams into some smaller episodes as well. We'll have to see. Uh, but stay tuned for that content. Subscribe if you're not a subscriber already. Leave a comment down below with any questions, an emoji. Just let me know that you're watching. But that's it for today, guys. God bless you. Love you. Peace.